This is Easter Sunday, guys. This is the reason, you know, this is the reason why we have church. This is the reason why we have community. This is the reason uh, for the season. This is the reason why we do what we do. It's because we have a risen king. We must not forget that our king sits on the throne and he's alive. And he's alive for all eternity. And he's ruling over all of us. And he's looking down on us today and he's smiling. I bet he's saying, wow, what a body of saints, what a body of Christ. You know, uh, it's so good to see all of you here on a 11 o'clock service. Um, I want to say hello to everybody here in the main sanctuary, and I hear I want to say hello to everybody um, in the overflow room as well, um, and online as well. Uh, we welcome you to SIBKL, so if you are the first time or the second time in this church, we really welcome you here into our church. This is where we worship um, every Sunday, every Saturday, so if you're new, don't, don't just leave because we've got something for you in a hospitality. We want to say hello to you. We want to pray for you. Our leaders will be there. Our pastors will be there um, on Easter Sunday. But you know, on Easter, um, it's, a, it's a beautiful service because it's a beautiful day, it's a beautiful weekend, not like other weekends are not beautiful. Um, other weekends are also beautiful um, because all weekends are created uh, by God, but today is especially beautiful um, because of what Jesus did. And we really want to talk about what Jesus did on that cross and the significance of His resurrection um, today. So today, um, the title of my sermon is Marked. Marked. Right? Not looped, not Johned, not Matthewed, but Mark. I don't know why I said that, but uh, it's just for you. Um, it's marked. Um, but before we, we go on to what I want to say, let's read Scripture together. Is that okay? We've got a beautiful uh, center screen today. So we're going to read from a beautiful center screen. So I'm just, I'm just going to walk to the side um, because I hear you can't see if I'm standing in the middle. But we want to read Scripture today. So we're going to read it all together from the main sanctuary, the overflow and online. Let's read it and declare Scripture into our homes and into our hearts. One, two, three. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love, He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Christ Jesus in accordance with His pleasure and will. To, be, to the praise of His glorious grace, which He has freely given us, in the one He loves, in Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, He made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In Him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of His will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of His glory, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, our inheritance until the redemption of those who are in God's possession to the praise of His glory. You know, this is a beautiful piece of uh, Scripture with big words, like conformity and predestined. And I really wish I could, t um, you know, I really do wish I could take it line by line because every line is beautiful in itself. But today I'm going to focus on only one, which is, of course, um, um, verse, verse 13. But like it or not, the word marked <clears throat> has many meanings. And I think in my calculation, in my research, it has about 10 to 11 meanings of the word marked. That's the beauty of the English language. You take one word and you put 11 meanings. It's called um, efficiency in language, right? You don't have to come up with new words uh, for different um, definitions. But what do you think of when I say to you mark? What, what comes to your mind uh, with the word mark? You see, for me, this comes to my mind. This automatically enters my mind. I'm scarred, scarred by it. I'm just kidding. Um, and always uh, when I hear mark, marks, whatever it is, um, 
education always comes to my mind. So, I, you know, um, I think in this service, the generations are a little bit more tight. Um, so I think most of you can identify with a report card. Um, you're going to need to tell me whether our kids still, still have report cards now these days, or is it electronic now, or is it online? I don't know, but this is the report card. And I'm going to give you uh, 15 seconds to analyze the grades that I got when I was young. You can, you can add, obviously, I took the best report card, right? <laughs> obviously, obviously, I didn't, I didn't put the... <laughs> I'm sure I failed one or two subjects. You'll never know, all right? Ignorance is bliss. But um, with, with marks, um, that's the first thing that came to my mind. That we're so, you know, we're brought up in, in an education system. It's not just Malaysia, it's everywhere across the world. You know, Singapore, America, it doesn't matter which country you live in. When you, you go from daycare, all the way to university, every year, twice a year, or four times a year, you will be graded. There will be marks, there will be an exam, you will have your marks, and then you will tremble in fear bringing it home to your parents, okay? Um, that's, that's, uh, that's us. But when I think of marks, um, and I go through what marks means for us, because we're so ingrained in our school system, um, and our cultural value system, that marks is a gradation. It, it assesses whether you fail or you pass. It assesses how good you are in life. It assesses everything. What we do as human beings is what we do is we mark every single thing in life. We start with, there's a constant value system in us that keeps marking everything, right? So it's not just exams anymore. It's not just um, tests or final papers anymore. What we do is we take that belief system and we apply it to everything else. All right. So, for example, let me. For example, if we go to, uh, um, I used this example in the last service. I liked it. When we go to a grocery store, we have to grade and we mark all our vegetables before we buy. Right. So I don't know about you. Maybe you do delivery now, or maybe you don't. You don't really care anymore. But I know. I remember when I was young, I followed my mother um, to the wet market, and every time she picks up a vegetable or a fruit, especially a fruit, um, she will always pick it up. All right. And she will always have to put her ear to the fruit. First, it's a gradation of how heavy the fruit is. All right. As if our our hands can tell a difference of 500 grams. But we would know. But we would know somehow. We put it to our ear, and then we have to we have to hit it a bit. Right? Especially if you have a pomelo or a watermelon, we have to hit it. And as if the sound that comes from our smacking of this poor little fruit, what did the fruit do to deserve such punishment from us? Nothing. All right? It just existed. But we have to hit it. And the frequency and the resonance of the sound will then somehow indicate to us how sweet the fruit is. All right? Somehow, somehow in the science of our understanding. If we go home, we cut it, and if it's not sweet, oh, there's some words that will come out of our mouth. I knew it. I knew I should have bought the other one, right? Uh, I knew, <laughs> the other one sounded better, right? You know, if we buy persimmons of apples, sometimes we have to hold it and squish it. Is it, is it tight or is it, is it bruised a little bit? And I, every time I, I, I hold that poor persimmon or that poor apple, whatever fruit that you're bruising, right, all of you here, I always think, Poor 20th person. The first person to touch it, obviously, you'll be firm and tight. But poor 20th person, what did the fruit ever do to you, to us, that we have to bruise it for the 10th person, 20th person, 100% confirmed? Sure, bruised. Sure, bruised, right? Um, but that's gradation. We have to mark everything. When we buy fish, there's a mark. When we buy beef, we have to look at the color. We have to look at the, the grains of the fats, how many fats. Then we have to grade it. Is it grade A, B, C, D, E, whatever it may be, right? And I'm sure in every culture we have this. But it's not just, it's not just grades, right? I'm sure it's children as well. I'm sure we, we, mark our, uh, we, we, have, we mark our children, right? Frank, not most of us here are parents, because I know the children are celebrating Easter uh, downstairs at the third service. But what we love to do is we would love to um, visit our friends. We've got children as well. And subconsciously, nobody's evil here. We're all good people. Nobody's evil. Subconsciously, we will always love to compare our children, because that is what we do. No matter how good you are, somehow you always say to your kids, why? How come the other kid can sit at the table, not move, and eat their food without a word from their parents, but you, <laughs> but you, you can't even stay still for a moment. Oh, hi, kids. <laughs> There's some kids in front. You are awesome kids. You are the best kids. You're in the adult service, and you're sitting there quiet. I didn't even notice you're there. See? I'm comparing. Why can't my kids? <laughs> Why am I? No, but we, that's what we do, right? Especially in Chinese New Year, where we go, we give ang pals all around. The first thing we do in our heads is, 
we want to open up the ang, ang pao packet to see how much the other person give, right? So we want to grade how rich or how poor the other person, how generous the other person is. You see, life is a gradation. Life is marks um, all over the place, whether you like it or not. If you want to find a spouse, 100% all of you will be like, I'm marking. If you're, if, if you're a young person like me, you're looking for a spouse, you'll be grading on a different scale. If you're a parent looking for a spouse for your children, you have a different gradation of scale, right? Some of you here are pre-believers. Some of you here have never come to church before. This is your first time. 100% I guarantee you, right, what's going on in your head is I'm grading this sermon to see when I can either fall asleep or it's time to take out my phone to check my, uh, my Instagram message, right, or my WhatsApp message. But we're grading everything. And like it or not, like it or not, when it's so ingrained within us, it's so ingrained within us, everything becomes a mark. Everything becomes a mark. When I see a person, I grade the person from 1 to 10, you're a good person. 1 to 10, you're a bad person. Everything becomes a mark. When I go into my career, what's KPIs? You know, every year you are assessed for a bonus in your company. What is that? Technically, that's an exam, right? It's just that in a, in, in a corporate circle, we don't call it exams anymore. We just call it KPI, all right? It's no longer uh, 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 it's your key performance uh, uh, index, right? It's everything is a gradation. Everything become a mark. And we mark everything from clothes to how you look, to how you talk, you know, to how you interact, to where you live, to what car you drive, everything is a mark. But the reason why we mark and we grade so easily, we give out grades so easily in our life, is because actually, if you really, really look at it, we're marked ourselves. We grade other people so freely, so easily, because at the end of the day, we all know deep down inside, we've already graded ourselves. We've already marked ourselves. Am I a good person? Am I a... Did I achieve well enough? I am, a, am I a success or a failure? And just in case you're wondering whether you're a success or a failure, before I move on, I thought, just came to me, I just thought I should say in this service to say that actually, technically speaking, in the school system, out of 50 people in the class, there's only one person that got number one. So actually, there are 49 failures, and there's one success. <laughs> so we're, we're actually all failures here, all right, in this school system. See, in, this, in the value system of this world, nothing is perfect. There's no perfect grading system. There's no perfect marking system. There's no perfect system to say, are you better? Are you worse? Who is better than who? It's all our own values. What do we carry on the inside? And the more we mark others, it's because we marked ourselves. We are grading ourselves on the inside. And sometimes we can't stand what we have on the inside. That's why we always cover ourselves up because we want to hide some marks that we have. Because up deep down on the inside, sometimes we, we realize we failed. We realize we're not good enough, so we want to cover it up. We don't want to show. That's why in Chinese New Year, we must dress the best, look the best. The family, the kids must not make as much noise as the other families. We must always put on a show. We must always do the best because we know we're not the best. So permit me on the Easter service, what we, what we what we need to do today is we need to remove that outer cloak. We need to remove this cloak and say, what is on the inside? Because like it or not, God don't look at what's on the outside. He doesn't judge us by how rich we are, how poor we are, what house we have, you know, what career and how successful you are in your career. That's not how God looks at us. When God looks at us in the Bible, He says He looks at our heart. He looks at the content of our heart, what's on the inside of us. But sometimes on the inside of us, we're marked, all of us here, like it or not, we're marked. For some of us, thanks, for some of us, you see, we're marked by an accident. An accident happened, so it scars us from the inside. We can't forget it. We can't let it go. Maybe it's in a car accident. Maybe it's an unwanted pregnancy. That's an accident. It scars us. We can't let it go. Sometimes, all right? It's a mistake that we did. Oh, we missed, made a mistake. Three, I said something I shouldn't have said to a family or to a friend, and now I've lost a relationship. I made that one mistake, and I've regretted it ever since. Maybe you've made a mistake in your workplace or in a relationship, or whatever it is. It's a mistake that you did, that, that you realized that you're stained. Or some of us, sometimes, it's just life. Life happens to you. 
It's no fault of your own. You didn't do anything wrong. You're just going about your merry little day, and then suddenly life hits you in the face, and then your whole life changed from there. There's a whole trajectory that changed. But what we like to do, because we realize all of us are marked, we are covered in shame all the time. That's why we want to do better, because it's shameful not to be good. It's shameful to get second place. It's shameful to get 49th place or the 50th place. It's shameful that my kid is not as well behaved. The other kid can say the Lord's Prayer at two years old. My kid, 10 years old, also cannot even say one word. You know, you're comparing all the time. So it's shameful. We're marked in shame. Something happened to your life, it's shameful. So what we like to do, what we always like to do as human beings and what we all do is we like to cover it up. See, we like to hide ourselves. So give me some creative license with my, my clothes. This is my personal clothing, right? We like to hide ourselves. We like to cover up our scars, cover up our stains, cover up our marks. So we hide ourselves with a hoodie. This is a hoodie. There we go. We like to hide ourselves. So we put a hoodie on ourselves. So we do what we need to do in our day. Then we go back home and we stay in our room the whole day. We don't want to come out because the moment we get out the house, we're reminded of our shame or somebody reminds us of our shame. So we want to hide ourselves. And some of us, we hide ourselves online. So we are our true selves online. But when it comes to face-to-face, -to -face, we, we don't know how to interact with people. We don't want people to see who we really are. So we get a different name online. We have a different avatar. We have a different alias online. We like to hide ourselves. But some of us, we don't hide ourselves. What we like to do is we need to prove ourselves. We need to show that we're good. We need to show the world. And this is, I think, most of us. We need to show that we have value. We need to show that we have worth in this life. So what we do is we chase our career, especially for guys, right? Um, maybe girls sometimes. Like, we chase our career. We need to be the best. We will do whatever it takes in order to get that promotion or to get that bonus or in order to live this lifestyle. We will do whatever it takes, cheat, kill, or steal, in order to get what we need. Because, in order, uh, because if we are the CEO, if we are the senior manager, then maybe people will respect us a little bit more. But if you're younger, maybe career is not your thing. What we like to do is we need to show that we've got it all together with our cars. We can't afford the car, but yet we need to get the car. I, I'm, I'm going to pay through my nose. I'm going to get through this loan because I need the car. We can't afford the house, but we need the big house. We need to live in a modern house. We need to renovate the house because when people come over, then they'll see that I'm established. I have value. I have worth in this life. So we cover up our shame. If you're a little younger this place, everybody wants to be a hero. Everybody wants to be an influencer. I mean, I also want to be an influencer in my life, right? I want to have 100,000 people follow me online. But what we do is I can't afford the cool shirts the change, the OOTDs every day, right? The outfit of the day, and I film one reel after another reel of the different outfit of the day. So what I do is I, I take loan. I need to see what my friends are wearing. So I need the latest Prada. I need the latest Balenciaga. I need the latest accessory. I need the latest phone to take the latest, the best picture, to upload it online in the best platform to get the most likes because the most likes would validate me as a human being. I would feel better about myself. Some of us, we like to prove ourselves. Some of us, we hide, we prove, but then some of us, we punish ourselves. We can't get over the mark because maybe we made that mistake. We just can't get over it, so we punish ourselves. We deny ourselves from life. We don't want to enjoy the fullness of life because we can't get over the wound. Maybe it's an unforgiveness that you're going through. Maybe somebody said something to you that you just cannot forgive. I cannot believe the person who I love the most betrayed me broke my trust. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to punish it. Maybe it's my fault. Everything's my fault. So you go through life. I'm not good enough. I will never match up. I will never be good as my siblings. I will never be good as my colleagues. I will never be good as whoever it is, my friends. I'm never good enough. So you punish yourself. And over and over again, every day, you remind yourself how bad you are, how guilty you are. See, that's, that's all of us. Because in life, life is suffering. Life is hard, life is tough, and we're marked, and we're marked by shame. But today, I believe Jesus wants to uncover it, and Jesus wants to show you who you are, and to show you how loved you are, that even though life may deal you a card that is unexpected, that you don't know is going to happen to you tomorrow, even though life deals you something bad, Jesus and God can still turn it around for good. I want you to watch this video as a testimony to the goodness of God.
I heard that somebody was screaming from the upper waterfall for help. Uh, so that's where I jumped right into the water and I managed to find him. So when I was giving CPR during the whole time, my heart just banging, crying to God and don't let this happen. Kevin and Adele, as cell leaders, they are very down to earth. Both of them have very big heart to grow the young adults. Attending our cell, Jars of Clay, during that time was really fun. Uh, because Kevin Adele was the type that organises a lot of trips and especially camping trips so not just doing the four W's during cell and like that's it. Kevin is a big person. Big not in the sense of size but big in the sense of his heart. If you walk in the room and you didn't know him, within five minutes you will be so comfortable talking to him. My first actual camping trip was also with Kevin and the whole cell uh, team member and it was very memorable because it was a miserable camping trip. It was raining throughout <laughs> and I've never gone camping in my life and it was soaked wet but it was so much fun because Kevin somehow just have this ability to make people feel comfortable and at ease in any uncomfortable situation. It was really their passion to go outdoors. We started our company with a friend called Amos. The nature of the business was we were running a lot of outdoor uh, hiking trips for tourists to a lot of these local places where the tourists wouldn't be able to find themselves. Most of the time, Kevin takes his clients on the weekends. Yeah, I remember it was a Saturday. Kevin and I were bringing a group of guests out to one of the waterfall tracks. So Kevin brought a few of the adults up to the upper waterfall while I was at the lower waterfall, you know, watching over the children and also a few of the other adults that stay at the lower waterfall as well. I heard that somebody was screaming from the upper waterfall, help, he must come up right now. So that's where I kind of ran up to the waterfall and people up there were saying, Kevin is in the water, we couldn't see him. So that's where I jumped right into the water and I managed to find him and I pulled Kevin out from the water and started CPR on him. One of the adults was having like trouble in the water that like he was a not very good swimmer and Kevin just jumped in and managed to push him out of the water, gave everything he had, pushing the other guy out and after that he just like lost consciousness and sank back into the water. I received this distress call telling me that something really terrible happened and he need me to call Adele. So I picked up the call and Adele answered in a very cheerful tone. It makes it even tougher for me to break that news. She told me and Kevin uh, there was an incident. He jumped in to rescue uh, one of his clients and he, 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 he went under. On the way to the hospital, um, in the car, I was praying with Jane. I'm like, Lord, please, please spare his life. Please don't, don't take him. I got a message from Amos saying that Kevin has gone back to Jesus. It took me a while to have the courage to show that message to Adele, who was sitting right next to me. Everything crashed. Uh, oh, came crashing out in the car. The thing that I felt I really lost was my best friend. Because he really was my best friend. Partner to bring up the children, father, um, husband. God, you have to help me. I don't know how I'm going to do this. Kids are so young. How do we even begin to move on from here? First thing I probably felt was like just scared that I would not be able to father them and mother them. I asked God, like, why not me? We should have just taken me instead of Kevin because at the time, I have no kids. So this is uh, one of Kevin's favourite waterfalls, actually. He called it Paradise Falls and he took this picture. 
This is also where we scattered his ashes. My favourite memory of my father is playing football and joking around with him. I wasn't very sure what happened to him but I knew that I wouldn't see him ever again. So I guess I felt a bit sad that I don't have a father. I remember that I asked my mom before. It was very devastating. And I'm so thankful for my cell members, who I call my family. Lah. They were just surrounded me. And it wasn't them having to say anything, they just would come, spend a bit of time with the children, uh, and just be there. After I lost my father, I felt like I didn't really have anyone to talk to or to enjoy myself with, but God redeemed it by surrounding me with people and church community that cared about me and felt like I have some extended family. Many times, I struggle with bringing up the kids or thinking like, oh my goodness, I'm a terrible mom, I'm screaming at them. There's always a reassurance from the Lord and it will be either through an article I read or a friend that I speak to or sometimes even just talking to the kids. And I remember saying to God like, Lord, you have been so faithful to me. I look back all the years, you've been so faithful to provide, to care for the children and I want to be faithful to you, and, you know. And so yes, I, you know, I do want to be my kinsman redeemer too, you know, and redeem the people who you put around me. I'm just reminded about how each of us we are in that relay race and in that section where you're running you run your most, your best you give your all because then you're going to pass on the baton to the next person and for me as my children that they are my main ministry they're my, the main ones that I'm going to pass this baton on to and God has something great in store for them and I don't know what it is but all I know is this part of that race that I'm running this relay I'm going to run my best. If anything, I, you know, that's what I can see in terms of how God has redeemed my life from that broken vase that was so broken when Kevin passed away and I felt that oh, I, can't, I can't put it all back together. But the Lord has done more than that, more than put me back together, but He has actually made me into this new picture, this new um, whole um, vast again that's able to not just look beautiful and, and whole once again but to be able to even do more. Before Kevin passed away like my identity was very much Kevin's wife. But obviously once he passed away it's like he's gone he's no longer there. Uh, so I think really in that process it was then beginning to see myself as actually you know what I am not a graphic designer, I'm not a mother, but I am a child of God. You know, and yeah, his promise is that he's my father, he's my good father, and he will take me through this song. It's only because of Jesus. It's only because of Jesus. What a wonderful story. Just two people I just really want to thank, first of all. Paul's here, he directed the video, um, and the Mac team, thank you so much Mac team, I'm not too sure, they're running around with the cameras, I know, but they, they directed all this and they put it all together for us, but I really want to thank Adele, she's actually here today, if Adele could just stand, that's Adele, you know, to honour you today, they really honour you today, and, but not just Adele, um, we want to honour um, the whole pastoral team, we want to honour um, everybody who is a single spouse or single parent. We want to acknowledge you today. We want to honor you today. If you're here, I don't know who you are, but if you're here in the sanctuary, it's not easy being a single spouse, single parent, but we thank you for doing it for the next generation because what you do is for the next generation of people that would run this race. You know, what's beautiful about this video is that, see, Adele could have been marked and mocked as being a widow. You know, she, has, she carries that stigma. Like she could have been mocked. She could have been mocked as, as a widow. Now, we all know her as that. Her children could have been mocked as fatherless, you know? Compared to all, compared to all the other children in school, the, their, her kids will be fatherless. 
But praise be to God, as if you watched the video, she was a broken vase, was broken 10 years ago. But because of Jesus, because of what He's done, because of the redeeming love of Jesus on her life, she has come out and she is no longer known as just a mother or just a wife or even by world as a widow, but she said herself, she is now known as a child of God. Amen? It's because of what God has done in her life. What God can do. And if God can do it in her life, God can do it in your life. You see, he's, this, our God that we serve is not a God of Adele only. He's a God of the world every single person. What, a, what an amazing journey is. When I first known Kevin and Adele, um, actually they're my district leaders all the way back when I was uh, not, not a pastor, let's put it that way, right? I know them all the way back then. And, um, but the beautiful thing is that now, because of how God has redeemed her, she's answered the call, the full-time call to be a pastor in this church. And she's an amazing pastor. She's an amazing young adult pastor. And she really fulfilled the words, you know, and it's not just to make her whole, but to also help other people to be whole again. You see, that is what it means when God redeems your life. That is what it means when God comes into your world, comes into your life, comes into your markings in your life, and God says He wants to redeem you. He wants to bring you back. You see, another beautiful part of that video, the beautiful part of that video is Kevin gave his life to save another. How many of us can ever say that, that we gave our life to save another? How many of us can ever say that even think or even fathom that we want to be a hero and give our life to another? See, we all love Superman or Iron Man, that we all want to be heroes. But what is a hero? A hero is a person who gives his life to save another. And I was just chatting with, with Adele, with Pastor Adele, and I was asking, where is, that, where is that man that he saved all 10 years ago? And she said, that man is now married, he's got uh, two kids, um, he was living in Singapore, but now he's migrated to Perth. And you see, the point of this story is that that man has a wife and kids. That wife has a husband, and his kids have a father because Kevin gave his life to save his life. And that is the story of Easter. That is the story of redemption, that our God in heaven came down to earth as one of us, flesh, marked by us, mocked by us, and He gave His life so that you and me, we can live, so that we can have children of our own, so that we can have a beautiful life, we can enjoy the movies and the desserts that we want to eat, that we can enjoy the house that we have or the family that we have. It's only because Jesus gave His life in order to save our life. That's the beauty of Easter. That's the beauty of why we believe in what we believe in. You see, this verse beautifully says, In Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Ephesians 1 verse 7. In Jesus, we have redemption through His blood. The blood of Jesus is precious. The blood of Jesus is literally the reason for the cross. The blood of Jesus redeems us. You see, it was Jesus' blood shed on that cross that redeems us. That's the cross. So if you don't know the meaning of that cross, because now these days, a cross is everywhere. You can wear a cross on your, as a necklace. You can wear a cross as an earring. You can wear a cross to do anything in your car. But that cross means everything to us Christians. That cross is the reason why we worship the way we worship and we serve the way we serve. Because at the foothill of that cross, on the foothill of that cross is a crown of thorns and three nails. It's a crown of thorns and three nails. Because on that cross, 2,000 years ago, with the three nails and the cross, Jesus was also marked. See, humanity marked Jesus. We marked Him. And He was marked for us. But what is the significance of His markings? What is the significance of Him being marked 2,000 years ago? His blood redeems us and forgives us of our sins. You see, if we did something wrong, you know it, nobody else knows it. If you made a mistake in your life, you know it, nobody else knows it. And God says, if you believe in me, 
I will redeem you with my blood. I will take my blood and I will wash you clean, white as snow. You don't have to bear the guilt of your unforgiveness and the mistake because He bears it for you. That's how precious His blood is. He washes us inside of us, white as snow, so that we can be free of condemnation, free of guilt, free of the shame that we live with in our whole entire life. His wounds redeems our sickness. You see, He was wounded one nail through His left palm, one nail through His right palm, And the longest nail was nailed in his ankles onto that cross. It took three nails to nail Jesus to that cross. But when Jesus was resurrected from that grave, he maintained the markings of the nails in order to prove to you and I that all the infirmities of our flesh, all the sickness of our flesh, all the diseases and the pain of our flesh, he took it upon that cross for you and for me, so that on Easter Sunday and forevermore, when we believe in Him, the resurrection, Yehovah, Rapha, healing power of God will come upon you and you will be healed. He wants you to be healed because He took your sickness for you. He does not want you to live in pain. He doesn't want you to live in sickness. He took it all upon Himself on that cross and He carried it all the way to His death. You see, his crowns redeemed our identity. See, the crown of thorns was supposed to mock Jesus, saying that you are the king of the Jews. You come, bring yourself down, save yourself. You can't save yourself, king of the Jews. It is to mock his identity. But he wore the crown of thorns in order to be mocked for his identity so that we as human beings never need to be mocked for ours. We have an identity in him that is a child of God, the child of the Most High God, our Father in heaven. And if you're an orphan in this place today, God is saying to you, God is your Father. If you have lost a loved one in this place, God is saying that I will re-father your children and I will be your lover. You see, God has redeemed our identity. See, some of us were lost in our identity. In this world, we're struggling with gender identity, identity, we're struggling with sexual identity, we're even struggling with political identity identity, we're struggling with nationality, identity. There's so many things that we're struggling with in our career. We don't know where, who we are in our career, what we want to do in our lives. We're all struggling with our identity. And God says, if you accept me and believe in me, I will come into your life and I will show you what it means to be a child of God. I will show you the love of the Father that you may have never felt before. You see, all those years back, fast math. 15 years ago, when I received Jesus, 18 years ago. See, one thing that I, I I'll never forget, when I received Jesus into my life, before I received Him, I says, God, I need you. And then God asked me, why? I said, I don't know. I don't know why I need you, but I just know I need you. And God says, I'll tell you why you need me. I will give you the love of the Father, a love that you've never experienced before, a love that no human being can ever give you. And I will show you that you are mine and I am yours forevermore. I received him into my life and I've never looked back since because it is the greatest, best decision that I've ever made. The joy of the Lord in knowing that I belong to him. I'm not an orphan in this world. I'm not a loner in this world. I belong to him is the best feeling. It's the best paradigm that I can ever have. You see, His crown redeemed our identity. And the best part is, His death redeemed our life. His death on that cross redeemed our life. I ask myself this question, and I ask you today, what is the final mark of death, do you think? Is it your last breath? Is it two days in the morgue? What is the finality of death? I think for me, for me, being a pastor for so long, attending so many funerals in this life, I think the finality of death, when reality hits you, is when you close the casket and you say your final goodbyes. It's the final time you say and see the person, your loved ones. It's when you close that casket. And I think that's when reality of death really hits you. 
What's the finality of death for Jesus? Because that time there was no casket. He was wrapped in linen. He was placed in a tomb. And the finality mark of death on his life is when the tombstone closed. Because dead man can't open a tombstone. You're dead. And even if you're not dead, it takes four men on the outside to open the tombstone. You can't open the tombstone. So even if you're alive in there, you're as good as dead in 7 or 14 or 21 days. And that's the story of some of us. Some of us here, that we are buried in our markings. We are buried in our stains. We are buried in our shame. We tombed ourselves in that grave because we don't want the world to see how shameful it is, how guilty it is, our mistakes and our pains and our past. So we hide ourselves from the world. We shield ourselves from the world. We bury ourselves in the tomb and say, and then after a while we say, we can't get out. And that's why sometimes we're just so stuck in our mindset. We're so stuck, some of us here, we're stuck in depression a little bit. We're stuck in our anxiety. We're stuck in a circle of, I need to chase my career, but yet I want to be with my family and I can't be there for everybody and I'm stuck in this loop and I'm stuck in the chase for money and we need to have the better car, the better house, the better, the better watch, the better socks, the better shoes, the better, the better phone. We need, to, we need to chase something better because maybe that thing will fulfill us. But I'm here to tell you that you can chase all the money in the world, it will never fulfill you. You can chase all the properties in the world and assets in the world, it will never fulfill you. You can chase all the greatest stocks, the dividends in the world, it will never fulfill you. You can look the best, you can have a thousand plastic surgeries, but you will never change the first image that you have of your face on, when you see yourself in the mirror. You can wear the nicest clothes, but it will never get rid of the scars and the marks that you have inside. Some of us are stuck in that tomb. But today, but today, we remember that even though Jesus was stuck in that tomb, God raised him up from the dead and he walked out of that tomb. The tomb door, the tombstone was rolled open and he walked out. But I need to tell you why he walked out. Why did God our Father raise him from the dead? You see, Jesus was also graded. Nobody escapes gradation. We're all graded here. Jesus was also graded. But when we grade Jesus, when we mark Jesus, when there is a mark and there's a test on Jesus' life, how many wrongs did He do and how many rights did He do? What we realize is that He did no wrong. He is a perfect man. He's blameless. He's sinless. He's stainless. He's markless. He did no wrong. But the reason why he had to die is because he had to carry your sins. He had to carry my sins. He had to carry your shame and my shame upon that cross. And because he carried the sins of the world, death had a hold on him and death claimed him. But death could not claim him forever because when God the Father looked upon his one and only begotten Son and said, this is my one and begotten Son, he is sinless, he's stainless, he's free of sin. I have the power to raise him up from the dead. And when he raised Jesus up from the dead with one miraculous breath, when Jesus rose and he walked out of that tomb, there is an invitation that was sent to each and every one of us that we are invited to join him to walk out of that tomb. Because the resurrection power of Jesus does not only rest and lie in Jesus Christ, it is living in each and every one of us who believe in Him. And God the Father, I believe, if we're stuck in that tomb this morning, I believe God the Father is calling you out. And He's saying that if you are stuck in depression, I call you out. You are no longer marked with depression. You are marked with life. You are marked with joy. Come out of that tomb. If you are caught up with the stigma of being a divorcee or an orphan or you lost your loved one. You are no longer stained by being a widow or an orphan or a divorcee because God is calling you up and saying that you are my child. You are my son. You are my daughter. If the world mocks you, who cares? Because God the Father has His fingerprint and His thumbprint upon your life and He's calling you out to assume your identity as His child. Whatever you are marked with, you could be marked with sickness, you could be marked with illness, you could be marked with loneliness. You could be marked with depression and addiction. And you are caught and stuck in that tomb and you don't know how to get out. But God is offering you a lifeline. He's reaching out His hand and He's calling you today. 
He's saying that you don't have to live with the mark of addiction. You don't have to live with the mark of depression. I'm calling to call you out. Will you take my hand and come out of that grave because you are marked with life. I am a life giver. God says, I will give you life and life abundant. I will give you Zoe life, the fullness of life, the health that you want. I will give you the identity that you want. I will give you the belonging that you so desire. I will take away your shame and I will take away your guilt. You see, as a Christian, we're all Christians. We will, I will never be able to get rid of the mistake that I did 20 years ago or the mistake that I did 25 years ago. I can never change the past. But what can change is that mistake will never have a hold on me every, anymore. That mistake is now a platform for me to go higher in Jesus. That mistake is now a platform for me to learn from my past and now for me to assume my identity in Christ and walk out of that tomb and says, Jesus, I will follow you the rest of my life because you took my sins upon yourself. You took my death upon yourself. You took my illness upon yourself. So that's why I love you. That's why I would follow you. And that's why I choose you. And that's why right now, if you tell me the mistakes I made 20 years ago, I will never deny it because it's true. I made that mistake. But that mistake will have no hold on me. That mistake will never define me as a person. That mistake will never say, Isaac, you are a good for nothing, useless person, because I know my worth and my value in Christ Jesus. And my worth and my value given by my God, my Father, is the same worth and value that He gives every single one of you. You're no different. You're no different. You're no different. God loves you. God loves you. He loves you so much. He loves you so much that He does not want to see you suffer in the tomb that you maybe have dug for yourself. That's how much He loves you. And that is why you're here today. But there's one thing, just one more thing. Because Ephesians 1.13 says, When you believed, you were mocked in Jesus. The key here is the word and the phrase, when you believe. I want to end with this. I want to say, that we are all birthed by Jesus, by, by God, that He breathed His Ruach, He breathed His Spirit into every human being. Whether you believe in Him or not, I believe that Creator God breathed His life into all of us, and His breath is our birthmark. We have a birthmark that is of the Most High, but a lot of us here, we have forgotten our birthright, our birthright in activating who we are in Jesus. The order, in order to claim our birthright is the point of belief. It is a point of when we say, Jesus, I believe in you. Oh, you are my father. Would you come and set me free? Would you come and rescue me from my sins? Will you take away my shame? Will you take away my guilt? And that is when the resurrection power of Jesus Christ will be placed in you and you will know who you are in Jesus. That is who you are. But you have to believe that this God Almighty loves you and loves me and loves the world that He gave His one and only Son to die for us, to save us from our sins so that we can be set free, so that we can live in that freedom. See, I want to make a call now. Can I just have every eye closed and every head bowed? I want to make a call because this is going to be the best decision you have for your life because I know it was the best decision I have for my life. For you to receive Jesus Christ for the very first time in your life. Or maybe you want to rededicate your life. You want to say to Jesus, I'm coming back into the Father's arms. I'm coming back into the house of prayer and worship. I want to come back. If your first time receiving Jesus, you want to say yes to Him. At a count of three, I would like to invite you to raise your hands high because our leaders and our pastors, we would like to come to you and pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, you are a good God that you love us all so much. You love him or you love her right now so much. Holy Spirit, you're pricking their life. You're pricking their heart right now because I know God is speaking to you. He's speaking to you because he loves you and he birthed you into existence. Thank you, Jesus. And because Jesus loves you and because he died for you and because God rose him up from the grave to live at the right hand of the Father, he's calling you to receive him. So one, two, three. If you want to receive Jesus for the first time in your life, would you raise your hands up high so that we can see who you are? 
so that we can identify who you are. If you want to receive Jesus into your life, you could raise your hands high. I want to give it a little bit more moment. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody to my left? You want to receive Jesus for the first time? Thank you, Jesus. I see your hand, sir. I see your hand. Thank you, sir. I thank you, sir. Is there anybody else? I see your hand, sir. Thank you so much. I see your hand. Anybody else? Anybody else to my right? You want to receive? I see your hand. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Anybody else? You want to receive Jesus for the first time? About the balcony? If that is you, I see your hand, sir. Thank you so much. Anybody else? You want to receive? I see your hand, ma'am. Thank you so much. I see your hand, ma'am. Anybody else? On to my top left. Anybody else? In the overflow rooms, there's a pastor's there to see your hands lifted up. Thank you, Jesus. I want to give it a 10 more seconds. If you feel a little bit nervous, if you feel your heart beating fast, Jesus is speaking to you. This is the best decision you'll ever make in your entire life. Better than winning a million dollars. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? If you want to receive Jesus for the first time, can I invite you, everybody who raised your hands, can I ask you, invite you to raise your hands up high and lift it up because your leaders want to come to you, those who are receiving Jesus. Lift it up because the leaders and pastors will come to you and they will invite you to the front because they want to pray for you, they want to know who you are, and we would love the opportunity to connect with you. But for the rest of us, I want to make a call. Could we all rise to our feet at a moment? I want all of us, I want to make a call today. I want to make a call in this service because I believe in Easter Sunday, God wants a breakthrough for your life. I want to believe that on Easter Sunday, God wants to meet you where you are and He wants to set you free from whatever pain, whatever struggle, whatever unforgiveness that you're struggling with. So I want to open up the altar and I want to make a ministry call. If you are struggling with a sickness and you want to be healed, I want to invite you to come on forward because we want to pray for you. If you're struggling with a hurt and a pain and a struggle that you've been struggling for the longest of time, I want to invite you forward and we want to pray with you. Give us that opportunity to pray with you on Easter Sunday and to believe that God wants to do something amazing in your life. So what we're going to do for the front is we're going to, uh, if it's okay, everybody sitting in front, uh, to get up, uh, we're going to stack the chairs because we're going to turn the front into an altar call. Thank you so much for your, for your help and cooperation. But if you don't leave the service, the service is still for you. If you could stand to the side, we want to change the altar call uh, uh, into a ministry area. So I'm going to open the altar in three seconds and then we're going to sing the song. And everybody who needs healing and everybody who has a hurt that wants to be prayed for, can you come on forward? We would love to pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, this is Easter Sunday. You know, at the first service, what really touched my heart was that when we called for salvation, there was a nine-year-old boy who raised his hands. And we might think nine-year-old boy may not know what he's talking about, but this nine-year-old boy was serious with Jesus. When we asked him, are you sure you know what you're raising your hands for? He says, yes, I need Jesus in my life. I want Jesus in my life. That's the beauty of salvation, you know. Today I want to call, if you have a loved one that you want to know Jesus, if God can save this nine-year-old boy, God can save your loved ones. Don't give up on them. Don't give up praying. It may be 20 years for some of you, but don't give up praying because God has a purpose in the 20 years and God has a purpose for your loved ones. So today I want to, I want to call, I know it's a bit crowded, but if you have a loved one that you are desperate to come to know Jesus, you can't take it, you're desperate. Maybe it's a spouse. I have a strange feeling there's a spouse. You have a spouse that don't know Jesus and you're desperate for him or her to come and know Jesus. I want to invite you to the front. We want to pray for you. If you have a spouse, I think there's space in the middle right here. So there's still space. So if you have a loved one that want to know Jesus, come to the forward, come to the front, and we want to pray for you and we want to intercede on your behalf for your loved one in the belief that in the next coming weeks or maybe even this year or maybe Christmas, he or she will come to know the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, I just want to thank you, Father God, that Easter Sunday, that we have the resurrection power of Christ that lives in us, Father God. Father God, because we have the resurrection power of Christ that lives in us, we will live for you, we will serve you, we would worship you, we would love you with all our might, with all our heart, with all our soul and all our strength. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that today we're so, so thankful for what you did on that cross for us. So we thank you, God, that you were obedient to the cross. 
I, Father God, I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that you separate all of us here with your favour, with your blessing, Father God. May your face shine upon us and you watch our going in and you watch our going out and may the shalom of God rest upon all the hearts and our homes. We thank you, God. All praise be to you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.